Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose Changer Pat. That's me, in case you're wondering. Today, we are reading Chapter 6 of Magician's Gambit by David Eddings, and as always, you should support the original work by buying the original book. Chapter 6 The procession of monks moved on, the sound of their chanting and slowly tolling bell growing fainter as they crossed the meadow. Mr. Wolf seemed a deep in thought, the fingers of his good hand stroking his beard. Finally, he sighed rather wryly. I suppose we might as well deal with him here and now, Paul. He'll just follow us if we don't. You're wasting your time, father, Aunt Paul replied. There's no way to reason with him. We've tried before. You're probably right, he agreed, but we should try at least. Alder would be disappointed if we didn't. Maybe when he finds out what's happening, he'll come around to the point where we can at least talk to him. A piercing wail echoed across the sunny meadow, and Mr. Wolf made a sour face. You'd think that he'd have shrieked himself out by now. All right, let's go to Myraman. He turned his horse toward the hill the wild-eyed monk had pointed out to them. A maimed ghost gibbered at him from the air in front of his face. Oh, stop that! he said irritably. With a startled flicker, the ghost disappeared. There had perhaps been a road leading over the hill at some point in the past. A faint track of it was dimly visible through the grass. But the thirty-two centuries which had passed since the last living foot had touched its surface had all but erased it. They wound to the top of the hill and looked down into the ruins of Maramon. Garion, still detached and unmoved, perceived and deduced things about the city, he would not have otherwise noted. Though the destruction had been nearly total, the shape of the city was clearly evident. The street, for there was only one, was laid out in a spiral winding in toward a broad circular plaza in the precise center of the ruins. With a peculiar flash of insight, Garion became immediately convinced that the city had been designed by a woman. M men's minds ran to straight lines, but women thought more in terms of circles. With Aunt Paul and Mr. Wolf in the lead, and the rest following in wooden face unconsciousness, they started down the hill to the city. Garion rode at the rear, trying to ignore the ghosts rising from the earth to confront him with their nudity and their hideous maiming. The wailing sound, which they had heard from the moment they entered Marigor, grew louder, more distinct. The wail had sometimes seemed to be a chorus, confused and distorted by echoes, but now Garion realized that it was one single mighty voice, filled with a grief so vast that it reverberated through all the kingdom. As they approached the city, a terrible wind seemed to come up, deadly chill and filled with an overpowering charnel house stench. As Garion reached automatically to draw his cloak tighter about him, he saw that the cloak did not in any way react to that wind, and that the tall grass through which they rode did not bend before it. He considered it, turning it over in his mind as he tried to close his nostrils to the putrid stench of decay and corruption carried on the ghostly wind. If the wind did not move the grass, it could not be a real wind. Furthermore, if the horses could not hear the wails, they could not be real wails there. He grew colder, and he shivered. Even as he told himself that the chill, like the wind and the grief-laden howling, was spiritual rather than real. Although Maramon, when he had first glimpsed it from the top of the hill, had appeared to be in total ruin, when they entered the city, Garion was startled to see the substantial walls of houses and public buildings surrounding him, and so not far away he seemed to hear the sound of laughing children. There was also the sound of singing off in the distance. Why does he keep doing this? Aunt Paul asked sadly. It doesn't do any good. It's all he has, Paul, Mr. Wolf replied. It always ends the same way, though. I know, but for a little while it helps him forget. There are things we'd all like to get forget, Father. This isn't the way to do it. Wolf looked admiringly at the substantial seeming houses around them. It's very good, you know. Naturally, she said. He's a god, after all but it's still not good for him. It was not until Barrack's horse inadvertently stepped directly through one of the walls, disappearing through the solid-looking stone, and then re-emerging several yards further down the street, that Garion understood what his aunt and grandfather were talking about. The walls and the buildings, the whole city, was an illusion, a memory. 
The chill wind with its stink of corruption seemed to grow stronger, and carried with it now the added reek of smoke. Though Garion could still see the sunlight shining brightly on the grass, it seemed for some reason that it was growing noticeably darker. The laughter of children in the distant singing faded. Instead, Garion heard screams. A tall Nadrin legionnaire in burnished breastplate and plumed helmet, a solid, as solid-looking as the walls around them, came running down the long curve of the street. His sword dripped blood, his face was fixed in a hideous grin, and his eyes were wild. Hacked and mutilated bodies sprawled in the street now, and there was blood everywhere. The wailing climbed into a piercing shriek as the illusions moved on toward its dreadful climax. The, spir the spiral street opened at last into the broad circular plaza at the center of Maraman. The icy wind seemed to howl through the burning city, and the dreadful sound of swords chopping through flesh and bone seemed to fill Garion's entire mind. The air grew even darker. The stones of the plaza were thick with illusionary memory of uncounted scores of Marag dead lying beneath rolling clouds of dense smoke. But what stood in the center of the plaza was not an illusion, nor even a ghost. The figure towered and seemed to shimmer with a terrible presence, a reality that was in no way dependent upon the mind of the observer for its existence. In its arms, it held the body of a slaughtered child that seemed somehow to be the sum and total of all the dead of haunted Maragor, and its face lifted in anguish above the body of that dead child, was ravaged by an expression of inhuman grief. The figure wailed, and Garion, even in the half-somnolent -som state had that protected his sanity, felt the hair on the back of his neck trying to rise in horror. Mr. Wolf grimaced and climbed down from his saddle, carefully stepping over the illusions of bodies littering the plaza. He approached the enormous presence. Lord Mara, he said respectfully, bowing to the figure. Mara howled. Lord Mara, Wolf said again, I would not lightly intrude myself upon thy grief, but I must speak with thee. The dreadful face contorted, and great tears streamed down the god's cheeks. Wordlessly, Mara held out the body of the child and lifted his face and wailed. Lord Mara, Wolf tried it once again, more insistent this time. Mara closed his eyes and bowed his head, sobbing over the body of the child. It's useless, father, Aunt Paul told the old man. When he's like this, you can't reach him. Leave me, Belgarath, Mara said, still weeping. His huge voice rolled and throbbed in Garion's mind. Leave me to my grief. Lord Mara, the day of the fulfillment of the prophecy is at hand, Wolf told him. What is that to me? Mara sobbed, clutching the body of the child closer. Will the prophecy restore my slaughtered children to me? Am I am beyond its reach. Leave me alone. The fate of the world hangs upon the outcome of events which will happen very soon, Lord Mara, Mr. Wolf insisted. The kingdoms of the east and west are girding for the last war, and Torak One-Eye, thine accursed brother, stirs in his slumber and will soon awaken. Let him awaken, Mara replied and bowed down over the body in his arms as a storm of fresh weeping swept him. Wilt thou then submit to his dominion, Lord Mara? Aunt Paul asked him. I am beyond his dominion, Polgara. Mara answered, I will not leave this land of my murdered children, and no man or god will intrude upon me here. Let Torak have the world if he wants it. We might as well leave, father, Aunt Paul said. Nothing's going to move him. Lord Mara, Mr. Wolf said to the weeping god, we have brought before thee the instruments of prophecy. Wilt thou bless them before we go? I have no blessings, Belgarath, Mara replied, only curses for the savage children of Nedra. Take these strangers and go. Lord Mara, Aunt Paul said firmly, a part is reserved for thee in the working out of the prophecy. The iron destiny which compels us all compels thee as well. Each must play that part laid out for him from the beginning of days, for in the day that the prophecy is turned aside from its terrible course, the world will be unmade. Let it be unmade, Mara groaned. It holds no more joy for me, so let it perish. My grief is eternal, and I will not abandon it, though the cost be the unmaking of all that has been made. 
take these children of prophecy and depart. Mr. Wolf bowed with resignation, turned, and came back toward the rest of them. His expression registered a certain hopeless disgust. Wait! Mara roared suddenly. The images of the city and the, its dead wavered and shimmered away. What is this? the god demanded. Mr. Wolf turned quickly. What hast thou done, Belgarath? Mara accused, suddenly towering in immensity. And thou, Polgara, is my grief now an amusement for thee? Wilt thou cast my sorrow into my teeth? My lord? Aunt Paul seemed taken aback by the god's sudden fury. Monstrous! Mara roared. Monstrous! His huge face convulsed with rage and terrible anger. He strode toward them and then stopped directly in front of the horse of Princess Sinedra. I will rend thy flesh! He shrieked at her. I will fill thy brain with the worms of madness, daughter of Nadra. I will sink thee in torment and horror for all the days of thy life. Leave her alone, Aunt Paul said sharply. Nay, Polgara, he raged. Upon her fall the brunt of my wrath. His dreadful clutching fingers reached out toward the uncomprehending princess. But she stared blankly through him, unflinching and unaware. The god hissed with frustration and whirled to confront Mr. Wolf. Tricked, he howled. Her mind is asleep. They're all asleep, Lord Mara, Wolf replied. Threats and horrors don't mean anything to them. Shriek and howl until the sky falls down. She cannot hear thee. I will punish thee for this, Belgarath, Mara snarled. And Polkara as well. You will all taste pain and terror for this arrogant despite of me. I will wring the sleep from the minds of these intruders. They will know the agony and madness. I will visit upon them all. He swelled suddenly in vastness. That's enough, Mara. Stop! The voice was Garion's, but Garion knew that it was not he who spoke. The spirit of Mara turned on him, raising his vast arm to strike, but Garion felt himself slide from his horse to approach the vast threatening figure. Your vengeance stops here, Mara, the voice coming from Garion's mouth said. The girl is bound to my purpose. You will not touch her. Garion realized with a certain alarm that he had been placed between the raging god and the sleeping princess. Move out of my way, boy, lest I slay thee, Mara threatened. Use your mind, Mara, the voice told him. If you haven't howled it empty by now, you know who I am. I will have her, Mara howled. I will give her a multitude of lives and tear each one from her quivering flesh. No, the voice replied. You won't. The god Mara drew himself up again, raising his dreadful arms. But at the same time, his eyes were probing, and more than his eyes, Garion once again felt a vast touch on his mind, as he had in Queen Salmisra's throne room, when the spirit of Issa had touched him. A dreadful recognition began to dawn in Mara's weeping eyes. His raised arms fell. Give her to me, he pleaded. Take the others and go, but give the tall Nadrid to me. I beg it of thee. No. What happened then was not sorcery. Garion knew it instantly. The noise was not there, nor the strange rushing surge that always accompanied sorcery. Instead, there seemed to be a terrible pressure as the full force of Mara's mind was directed crushingly at him. Then the mind within his mind responded. The power was so vast that the world itself was not large enough to contain it. It did not strike back at Mara, for that dreadful collision would have shattered the world. But it stood, rather, calmly, unmoved, and immobile against the raging torrent of Mara's fury. For a fleeting moment, Garion shared the awareness of the mind within his mind, and he shuddered back from its immensity. In that instant, he saw the birth of uncounted suns swirling in vast spirals against the velvet blackness of the void, their birth and gathering into galaxies and ponderously turning nebula, encompassing but a moment. And beyond that, he looked full in the face of time itself, seeing its beginning and its ending in one awful glimpse. Mara fell back. I must submit, he said hoarsely, and then he bowed to Garion, his ravaged face strangely humble. He turned away and buried his face in his hands, weeping uncontrollably.
Your grief will end, Mara, the voice said gently. One day you will find joy again. Never, the god sobbed. My grief will last forever. Forever is a very long time, Mara, the voice replied, and only I can see to the end of it. The weeping god did not answer, but moved away from them, and the sound of his wailing echoed again through the ruins of Maramon. Mr. Wolf and Aunt Paul were both staring at Garion with stunned faces. When the old man spoke, his voice was odd. Is it possible? Aren't you the one who keeps saying that anything is possible, Belgarath? We didn't know you could intervene directly, Aunt Paul said. I nudge things a bit from time to time, make a few suggestions. If you think back carefully, you might even remember some of them. Is the boy aware of any of this? she asked. Of course. We had a little talk about it. How much did you tell him? As much as he could understand. Don't worry, Polgara. I'm not going to hurt him. He realizes how important all this is now. He knows that he needs to prepare himself and that he doesn't have a great deal of time for it. I think you'd better leave here now. The Talnadrin's girl presence is causing Mara a great deal of pain. Aunt Paul looked as if she wanted to say more, but she glanced once at the shadowy figure of the god weeping not far away and nodded. She turned to her horse and led the way out of the ruins. Mr. Wolf fell in beside Garion after they had remounted to follow her. Perhaps we could talk as we ride along, he suggested. I have a great many questions. He's gone, Grandfather, Garion told him. Oh, Mr. Wolf answered with obvious disappointment. It was nearing sundown by then, and they stopped for the night in a grove about a mile away from Maramon. Since they had left the ruins, they had seen no more of the maimed ghosts. After the others had been fed and sent to their blankets, Aunt Paul, Garion, and Mr. Wolf sat around their small fire. Since the presence in his mind had left him, following the meeting with Mara, Garion had felt himself sinking deeper toward sleep. All emotion was totally gone now, and he seemed no longer able to think independently. Can we talk to the other one? Mr. Wolf asked, hopefully. He isn't there right now, Garen replied. Then he isn't always with you? Not always. Sometimes he goes away for months, sometimes even longer. He's been there for quite a long while this time, ever since Asherak burned up. Where exactly is he when he's with you? The old man asked curiously. In here, Garen tapped his head. Have you been awake ever since we entered Maragor? Aunt Paul asked. Not exactly awake, Garion answered. Part of me was asleep. You could see the ghosts? Yes. But they didn't frighten you? No. Some of them surprised me, and one of them made me sick. Wolf looked up quickly. It wouldn't make you sick now, though, would it? No, I don't think so. Right at first, I could still feel things like that a little bit. Now I can't. Wolf looked thoughtfully at the fire, as if looking for a way to phrase his next question. What did the other one in your head say to you when you talked together? He told me that something had happened a long time ago that wasn't supposed to happen, and that I was supposed to fix it. Wolf laughed shortly. That's a succinct way of putting it, he observed. Did he say anything about how it was going to turn out? He doesn't know. Wolf sighed. I'd hoped that maybe we'd picked up an advantage somewhere, but I guess not. It looks like both prophecies are still equally valid. Aunt Pa was looking steadily at Garion. Do you think you'll be able to remember any of this when you wake up again? She asked. I think so. All right, then. Listen carefully. There are two prophecies leading toward the same event. The Groms and the rest of the Angorax are following one. We're following the other. The event turns out differently at the end of each prophecy. I see. Nothing in either prophecy excludes anything that will happen in the other until they meet in that event, she continued. The course of everything that follows will be decided by how that event turns out. One prophecy will succeed, the other will fail. Everything that has happened and will happen comes together at that point and becomes one. The mistake will be erased and the universe will go in one direction or the other as if that were the direction it had been going from its very beginning. The only real difference is that something that's very important will never happen if we fail. Garion nodded, feeling suddenly very tired. Belden calls it the theory of convergent destiny, 
least, Mr. Wolf said. Two equally possible possibilities. Belden can be very pompous sometimes. It's not an uncommon failing, Father, Aunt Paul told him. I think I'd like to sleep now, Garen said. Wolf and Aunt Paul exchanged a quick glance. All right, Aunt Paul said. She rose and took him by the arm and led him to his blankets. After she had covered him, drawing the blankets up snugly, she laid one cool hand on his forehead. Sleep, my Belgarian, she murmured. And he did that.